this is really the great. Uh, so my talk is really going to be about physics and chemistry of qubits, and uh, I will share my slides. And um, I've got dual screens going, so hopefully. Uh, when I share this screen, um, that whole collapse, the whole zoom window. So let's try to bring that back so I can see chat and everything. Um, it would be great if you have questions, feel free to um, uh, chime in either by. Um, uh, turning your camera on or just your mic, feel free to interrupt me and say, excuse me, I have a question or um, I'm trying to monitor chat. And so that would be an okay way to uh, get my attention as well. So hopefully you can see my slide and the little hand icon of the cursor. Someone please let me know if that's working correctly. Yes, we can see it. Great, thank you. So, I'm coming to you from Maryland tonight. Uh, I work at the Laboratory for Physical Sciences. Uh, I've been a research scientist there for about 20 years. I'm a professionally trained material scientist and got into quantum computing maybe about seven years ago. Uh, my expertise is crystal growth and uh, happy to talk about my educational journey and my research and how I ended up getting into uh, uh, quantum computing and qubits, but I'd like to share with you um, what really excites me about this technology. Um, and I know I looked through some of the YouTube workshops that are posted on this uh, community, which I think are really great. Um, some of that content is really fantastic. But I noticed that it's a lot of computer science and algorithm and how uh, quantum computers are going to be functional. And I wanted to, to give a, a little bit different perspective uh, in terms of how do we actually build a quantum computer or more specifically, uh, how do we build a qubit? Where do they come from? What are the ideas? What's the, the background science behind that? Um, and so that's, that's the outline that I, I have presented here. We're gonna start off with just a little bit, just a teaser of why invent a quantum computer just to ground the conversation if that part's really exciting to you, there's, there's much better videos um, on, on this workshop series and, and elsewhere in terms of the details. We'll just you know, kind of gloss over that. But I'll, I'll do a comparison between some very simple classical computing hardware and quantum computing hardware, realizing that they're related and that quantum, you could think of quantum computing as an evolution of classical computing. And then we'll look at some design criteria different uh, hardware examples uh, from trapped ions and NV centers to phosphorus donors, silicon germanium qubits and superconducting circuits. A little bit of a you know, high level uh, description in terms of what that, uh, what are the concepts behind how they're made. Um, and then lastly, uh, I'll touch on some of the skills that are useful in QIS curriculum. And uh, lastly, if, um, if I haven't mentioned it already, um, really appreciate any questions along the way. So feel free to, to jump in. I am getting a little bit of an echo. So um, I noticed that there are people who don't have their uh, microphones muted. So if you don't have a question, if you please mute yourself, that would be appreciated. So in terms of computing and, and complexity, I, I have this graph and this is uh, uh, from uh, Suter's book and it just describes some complex uh, space in terms of computation complexity. Everything that is in engineering and computing space um, is really classifi classified. Classification, it's useful in biology uh, in, in terms of understanding how different organisms are related. It's useful in geology, in terms of understanding different rocks. I mean, it's also useful in computation. And here, this graphic is, is just trying to represent kind of the space of computers. And I put this here not to, to really go into any of the details of it, but just to realize that 
Um, the purpose of building a quantum computer is not to be uh, a replacement for all types of computing. So if we look in this outer range of e-space, that's essentially classification that all the problems that can be solved by a, a Turing computer, a, a classical, supposedly universal uh, computer. It could be mechanical uh, or electronic, uh, with typically thought of in terms of classical algorithms and um, computation uh, capabilities. If you go and you look at these smaller spaces, this so this green space P, that represents polynomial space computing efforts. Um, that's essentially the small bit of problems that are efficiently solved by computers. It's actually quite large. As we know, we're, we're using a computer now to communicate. We use it on our phones quite ubiquitously. You know, this thing is like super important to, uh, to me and to, to many other people. And um, outside of that, there are some problems that are solved by, not really solved well by computers. And so it's those really hard problems that we want to have not just a bigger and bigger computer, but something that makes calculations in, in a different fashion, something that's efficient in a different way. And so that's the bounded error quantum um, um, uh, polynomial space, the BQP space that um, in the teal area. There's also the non-deterministic -deter polynomial, the non-deterministic polynomial complete, the MP complete. These are just different classifications in terms of how hard is the problem really to solve. And coming back to this, you know, we are not going to be playing Minecraft on a quantum computer someday, uh, but it may be some artificial intelligence that's trying to do some sort of image recognition or something that's really complex that we may be doing things in the quantum computer. The original idea for a quantum computer actually came from Richard Feynman. The idea of, hey, atoms go together, they're complex. They're, they're uh, quantum objects. Wouldn't it be great if we had a computer that was working in its native space to solve problems with, related to how atoms interact with each other? And so it's that quantum space that also is an exciting area in terms of simulation and trying to figure out calculations. So the idea is not that the problems are inherently hard, but that they scale to be really hard. And so it may be that if I'm looking at just four photos and I'm trying to find a picture of myself, that it's not so hard. And so that's a relatively small set of images. But if I'm looking through all the pictures that are on the internet, trying to find one of myself, that's a really, really hard problem. I've got to go through an awful lot of pictures. And so not saying that searching, certainly the Grover search is an algorithm, but this may or may not be a, a useful problem to use as a, a quantum uh, a cube computer for. But if it is, what we'd be looking at is as that problem got more and more uh, larger in scope, this blue trend is increasing and this is a, a logarithmic scale. So um, some large scaling. Um, and if we happen to have that problem posed correctly and we did it on the right hardware, a quantum hardware, and we use the right algorithm, perhaps it would be done a lot faster. And so life might be better, might, might, be, uh, might be a little bit better. So machine learning, travel and salesman problems, all these algorithms are really interesting. The deutsch Josa problem is, is a great uh, introduction to this in terms of trying to figure out, um, hey, how can we actually solve these problems uh, in a faster manner? Well, let's take a look at what's underneath the algorithms. Let's look at to see how the information actually flows through uh, the chip. And so in a normal computer, we have transistors that are made from silicon. We have resistors. Uh, there are voltages and currents that flow through these circuits. We also can have capacitors and inductors. Uh, mostly it's resistors and transistors in, in integrated circuits. Though. And when we have uh, an element like the one that I've drawn here, uh, we can have this transistor. It can be in the on state or the off state. And this circuit is set, set up so that we have um, an input, a single input here that's represented as A, and this is the input state. And when this is on, the voltage is shunted through this transistor down to ground. So the voltage will go down through this resistor and out the bottom, and it won't go into this output. And so that's an inverter or a, a NOT gate. What's 
important, not in necessarily is it how this functions, how this turns on and off. Uh, the opposite case is true. When this is no voltage is here, the transistor is turned off and this voltage then goes out to this output line. The important thing is that the information is flowing through this object. When we make the circuit, the engineers and the people who are designing these circuits and um, the computer scientists who are figuring out the flow of information through it, um, these resistors are put into this, the chip. The transistors are designed and made in the, the fab and uh, they never move. The information goes through the circuit, in this case, from the left to the right. Um, and if you wanted to do a whole bunch of data streams, you'd have to have a lot of copies of this. Maybe you'd have to do a, a 16 of them if you wanted to do a 16-bit word. And so we actually have to build our circuit to match the, the, the width and uh, the depth of the information that we want to put through it. So I don't know if you're reading the words on the left, but this is kind of going through some of these high level things. In terms of our binary logic, we can call them ones or zeros or true or false. It really is Boolean logic that builds up the whole algorithm for how our, our computer chips work today. And from that, we can actually get a universal gate set, or that means we can have a complete Turing machine and solve uh, a large number of problems. And if we want to have a really, really, really big computer, then we just have, have to have a lot more of these, um, these elements in parallel. And we have to do a calculation on every single probability. There's no multiplexing in terms of hardware. You can multiplex the information in terms of how we encode it, but we have to have a single set of these resistors and transistors for every data line and for every calculation that we want to do. Now, on a quantum computer, it's a little bit different. If you study quantum computing, you know that superposition is a, a really big thing. And so here in this particular example, I'm only talking about one single qubit. And so entanglement really doesn't come into play. I'm just interested in talking about the quantum states and we can represent them as this, this wave function uh, psi and have basis quantum states, the zero state and the one state. Alpha and beta are complex numbers and there's, uh, entire lectures again to go into more details of this. But what's interesting about uh, quantum computing here is that the data, this bit of information is no longer just the zero or one, but it can be a mixture of the two. So we can get superposition of the data. And because we can have superposition of the data, we now can effectively get parallelization by combining operations on a single qubit that is in more than one state at a time. And, and that enhancement then gives us some of the computational advantage that quantum computing can offer. But there's also a fundamental difference. And I'm gonna describe that here on the right. And what I've described here on the right is a basic energy diagram for a rare earth atom. So this is in the, the trapped ion picture of quantum computing. And uh, I'll go into a little bit more detail in terms of what these atoms are. Uh, and in terms of uh, what these specific representations are. And so here, these are the energy states. And so these are just like the hydrogen atom where we had multiple quantum numbers and an electron could be in any one of those quantum states. Here, we're talking about in these energy levels, there's only one electron. And as we start at the bottom, we can take this electron that is down at this starting in the one level, and we can excite it by having a packet of energy arrive in the form of a photon. And so right away, we see that qubits are all combined and connected by electromagnetic radiation. And um, we can actually get that state to be uh, relaxed by giving off a photon. If it's in this state, we can actually have another microwave tone and cause it to interact with the zero and the one state. So this is another energy level. So we can have a direct manipulation. Again, it's through electromagnetic radiation. And then lastly, we can do what's called a readout state where we, if we can put another laser tone, another photon that then could excite it up to this upper state. And if it's sitting up here, then it might relax and give off a fourth color. And so here, depending upon where we are, if we start in the one state and we try to excite it, we can see and verify by this photon that's emitted, what state it's in. 
If it's in either one of these states, we can move it back and forth by this tone. And then when we want to do a readout, when we give up, uh, we give it to this last photon. If it's in the zero state, it will be promoted to this energy level and we'll see a bright photon come out. But if it's in this one state, it won't be promoted all the way up there because that energy is conserved. And so it, it will be dark. And so we can then create this not state through a series of photons that are shine or shown down onto this individual atom. And we can do the same sort of logic operation. Now, what's interesting here is that there's no motion. There's no physical motion of information through this object. It's just an atom that's levitating in space. And we're putting light onto this atom and we're doing calculations by it. And so it's more about the functionality of this, this atom is about what kind of photons I send its way, not necessarily what is the circuit that I designed back in the factory. So I can reconfigure it really easily. And um, each one of these manipulations have to be really tuned to the specific type of atom that's being used. Before I get into the, the different types of quantum computing, I would like to mention that there are two different types of quantum computers. Uh, there is the gate-based quantum computing, also known as universal quantum computing. These are the ones that I'm gonna be talking about today. They're the ones that are being pursued by companies like IBM, Google, Rigetti, uh, uh, Intel, uh, IonQ, and Honeywell. Then there are a bunch of other companies doing research into this space. Uh, adiabatic quantum computing is a completely different uh, class of computing. Um, and uh, I'm not going to be talking about that um, because it's uh, a, a field all into itself. Uh, and the reason I'm talking about the universal quantum computing because it's more analogous to the, the classical computers that we're so used to using, where it's a universal gate set and we can solve a, a larger scope of problems. So, so when we want to build one of these uh, gate-defined quantum computers, uh, we have to have a couple criteria for what the, the qubits do. What does the information have? And so one of the things that we can do is we can write those criteria down. And David DiVincenzo did this a number of years ago. And he came up with a couple of criteria. And the first one is that you have to have a quantum system with two energy levels that are distinct. So that example that I gave just a couple of screens ago, there were several energy levels involved but there are actually only two involved in the, in the manipulation, the zero and the one state. And they were isolated based on the energy separation. So we could have unique photons come down and, and do specific things. The other states were useful for readout. And so, um, but the actual calculation was just from two quantum states. We have to be able to initialize a system just like a, a, any sort of computer. You have to know what your starting point is. And so we have to be able to do that. For that to happen, most of the most techniques actually just allow things to cool down and get down to the very basic of zero, as close to you know what you might say, um, the, the bottom energy level close to zero um, uh, Kelvin, if you will, um, if we're talking about thermal energy. And uh, to make that happen, we have to have thermal vibrations pretty much eliminated from the system. So everything has to get really, really, really cold. And so we put things typically in a, a dilution refrigerator that gets really close to zero Kelvin down to 0 0.015 degrees Kelvin minus 272.85 degrees Kelvin. Um, and that's to help out with uh, getting rid of errors into the quantum uh, uh, qubits. We have to be able to have universal gate sets. So we actually actually have single qubits and two qubits that actually allow superposition and entanglement. We have to have good measurements. Uh, measurements of quantum objects is difficult. Uh, we, we describe them as being projection onto uh, real states so we can make observations. And I see that there is a hand raise. Um, so um, the, after this last step, uh, long coherence times, we have to make sure that we can get really, really good information onto these qubits. So um, I'm not sure how long your hand was raised, uh, Jerome. So, um, so, um, so, so, so I have a question about like, um, 
um, uh, about like what we're just talking about. So like um, so 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 like so so, 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 so like um, so, like like you know that quantum like computers cannot like work like in disturbances. So like, can't they put like uh, uh the quantum computer like like in a space vacuum? So most of the quantum computers are definitely in vacuum. Uh, when you say space vacuum, you mean outer space sort of thing? Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's, I'm trying to think of, I'm not aware of anybody who's put a quantum computer in space, uh, but on earth we can actually put things in a, a sealed vessel and we can pump down and get all of the air out of it. And all of these quantum computers work in a vacuum system. And so it is in a condition that is very similar to space. Um, and it's also cooled down uh, so that, um, so those conditions are similar to space, but actually in the, in the laboratory, we can get to better vacuums and we can get to colder temperatures. And so okay. going to outer space would probably make things worse. Okay, got it. But thank you for the question. That's great. So I'd like to talk about the hydrogen atom. And hopefully everybody has heard of the quantization of atoms and energy levels around uh, electrons uh, traveling around the nucleus. And that there are some principal quantum numbers that are important in terms of understanding exactly what's going on. There are a bunch of solutions. I'm not really interested in going through the math, but what I have here are maps of those different energy levels for the different quantum numbers. and um, you can see that some of these uh, states are circular and round in shape, and some of them have multiple lobes, some of them have four different lobes, and as we go to higher and higher quantum numbers, the number of peaks in here changes quite dramatically. And that's really important for understanding what's happening with the atoms, but it's also important to understand uh, what's going to allow us to manipulate these energy levels if we're going to try to put information into these different states. And there's another question, so please go ahead. So, um, so like, what do these quantum numbers represent? So these different numbers are the principal quantum numbers. They're actually solutions to Schrodinger's equation, which is okay. defining, it's like a, an address for an electron that's in a particular state around the nucleus. And every atom has a, a number of quantized energy shells. We call them levels or shells. And so each one of these diagrams that I have here, it will be unique to every type of atom. And every atom has a different number of electrons that are traveling around it in its um, uh, equilibrium state. And we can actually go through and calculate what the occupation of these different levels are. And so perhaps you've looked at some of the, the principal numbers like N in terms of the 1S and 2S and 2P and 3D levels in terms of what the electron occupation is. And that's what the first number is. And the rest of them have to do with uh, things like angular momentum that are important in terms of actually getting these pictures out. So another so question. Those, um, so, so, so like the number sets are basically like vectors? So they're called principal quantum numbers. And so each one of okay. these electron shells, uh, the electron can only be in, have one particular energy and have one particular state. And so it's actually uh, n not necessarily a vector in terms of X, Y, and Z in a particular coordinate, but it is uh, giving, a, I would say more like an address in terms of what state the electron actually is in. Okay, got it. Okay. So in terms of manipulating these states, uh, it, it's a technology that actually has evolved in terms of magnetic resonance imaging. I don't know if anyone's gone and, and had a soft tissue um, injury. Maybe you've uh, torn a ligament or um, I've had to go in there because I had some cartilage problem a number of years ago. Um, but uh, these are machines that actually look at uh, the, the resonances that are happening in uh, water molecules. And so I'm going to jump over this kind of quickly in the hydrogen level. We have these principal quantum numbers we talked about before. 
there are fine levels, there are hyperfine levels, so it can split off into very different levels of um, uh, different energy levels. And as uh, a quantum information scientist, we can actually use these and manipulate them. And one of the ways that we can manipulate them is through a magnetic field. And so as we have these states, for example, some of the states that are associated with uh, the hydrogen atom, if we put it in a magnetic field, so this might be a, an electromagnet, so a, a big coil with lots of wires wrapped around it with the current going through it creates a, a magnetic field. And as we do that, these quantum states can actually change. Some of them go up in energies and some of them go down. And so we can adjust the levels uh, through a magnetic field. And that gives us some control. So now that we're controlling quantum states, uh, we can think about, all right, if I'm gonna do something with information on a quantum state, not only do I have to be able to understand what particular state an electron is, essentially that address that we talked about a few slides ago, but we also have to be able to adjust and tune and move it around. And this interaction through spin resonance and the Zeeman effect and magnetic fields allows us to do that. Another question, go ahead. Um, so, so, so is this like any, like we're related to how like motors work? Uh, gasoline motors or electric motors? Just, yeah, yeah, electric motors. So electric motors are a little bit different. So that's very classical. We call them classic physics, where you have uh, a mag magnetic field and you have um one set of magnets that are on a rotor that goes around and you have another set of magnets that are stuck on the outside. So we call that the stator and the rotor. And it's how we control the magnetic fields of those pieces together that interact. There's no quantum interaction with motors at all. It, it's just associated with the magnetic field. Okay, got it. So when we go and we actually look for resonances, resonance we can measure by of any particular atom, we can measure by shining electromagnetic light on it and it can absorb light and, or it can re-radiate light. And uh, we can look at these different signals that we get out and those signals can tell us something about some of the quantum numbers that are associated with the atoms that we're looking at. And each one of these, we can move left or right and we can make the split bigger or smaller based on magnetic fields. The other thing we need to look at is do quantum levels interact? So if we actually want to have quantum information and we have two different qubits, we have one qubit here and another qubit next to it, if they somehow can't see each other, so maybe this one has a transition energy that reacts to a blue photon and this one reacts to a, a red photon, they won't interact at all because their energies are too different. And so as we tune the magnetic fields, they may just cross over and we might see those resonance changes. And so graphing those here, the blue uh, qubit may be going up with magnetic field and the energy separation for the red qubit may be going down and they can cross, they don't interact at all. So that means that we could never make a two qubit quantum information system around them. However, if the two qubits are close and they do interact, then something called an avoided crossing happens. This is really cool because this is showing that the, the actual, the two qubits, the blue one and the red one, actually exchange information. So there's any energy exchange between the two. And we can see that spectroscopically. So instead of being crossed over as we tune it, uh, as shown in the dotted lines, which is the same with the previous plot, we have this yellow and the purple lines and they bend over and they don't cross at all. And so these are some spectroscopic uh, details that we can tell just by looking at quantum systems to figure out, is it gonna make a good qubit or is it not gonna make a good qubit? And so it turns out that there are a lot of atoms that actually spectroscopically look like hydrogen. And so some of them I've highlighted here in different colors, they tend to be alkali-like ions based solely on spectroscopy. When you put these atoms in a magnetic field and you shine different, uh, different energy photons on them, uh, we can actually get things that look very much like the energy of a hydrogen atom, even though they've got a lot more neutrons and protons and electrons. 
but how do we get quantum information? So I'm gonna skip over this. This is just some of the details associated with a calcium atom and how those different uh, electron shells look in terms of graphing their probabilities. But what's really cool is how we actually use that. And so if we wanna actually do a quantum computer uh, computation on a single ion of calcium, we might have to do something like this experiment. So this is a, I'll talk you through it really quickly. Um, this is an ultra high vacuum chamber. So the vacuum here is better than space. Um, it's such that there's essentially nothing inside. Uh, there are no atoms. So if you do put an atom, it's gonna bounce around uh, and ricochet off the walls uh, for, for a really long time. And it's not gonna hit anything. It's just gonna keep bouncing off the walls. So in this particular case, we have this oven. And so this experiment was strontium, um, but it doesn't really matter what kind of oven it is. We could put calcium in the oven. We heat it up a little bit and some atoms come off. They just evaporate, uh, much like steam evaporating off of a pot of water on your stove. When things get hot, atoms get ejected. And that atom, when it comes down, we can capture it in this area called a magneto-optical trap. It's a really cool a design that has magnetic fields um, and it traps that atom and makes it levitate right in the center of that trap. Then take another photon and we can actually use uh, the photon to push that atom that's now just suspended and has been cooled down to maybe effectively a few degrees Kelvin, push it along the way and let it sit on this uh, chip, get it close to this chip where we're actually gonna do the experiments. And that chip is cooled down to, to maybe, you know, very close to zero Kelvin. And that chip will look something like this perhaps. And so these are, uh, they're called high optical axis surface traps because the atoms levitate right across the center strip. And but that center strip also has a, a groove cut into it. So lasers can go uh, from the left, from the right, coming from the bottom or the top, but also come out of the board through the bottom of the chip. You can see that slot in this lower right picture, that dark line, that's the actual slit in the chip where they can actually have lasers come up from the bottom side of it. And these atoms will land and they'll load in these areas on these parts of the Y and they'll move them into this area and they'll push them left and right. They can move them around using electrostatic forces. Uh, one of the things that has to happen is one electron has to be pulled out, so it's ionized. So ionized just means that the, that the, the charge in the nucleus is different than the charge in the electron cloud. And so with that charge, they can then move them around and manipulate them. So an atom is an obvious quantum object, but what's another quantum object? Well, it turns out that in this other case, a levitating atom all in, in vacuum and uh, free space, not interacting with anything around it is really good. But what if we try to identify an atom that's in a crystal? And so one of the ideas is silicon because of the computer industry is one of the best materials, most refined and well-studied and, and highest purified materials that uh, has ever been created. What if we put something different in a perfect crystal of silicon? And so this is a picture of the electronic wave function of a single phosphorus atom. So if you take off one of the silicon atoms and you replace it with a phosphorus atom, the phosphorus atom has a different number of electrons. It actually has an extra electron compared to silicon. And that electron is actually gonna hang out around it, but it's gonna be spread out. So you see that this color map has not only the, 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 uh, the location clustered around that phosphorus atom, but the pattern matches the symmetry of the silicon crystal that it's in. And so that's pretty cool. Now we're having this hybrid system where we're looking at uh, a quantum object that's embedded in a solid. And we can make that by two different ways. One way is to shoot it in with uh, like an atom guns. We call that ion implanting. Um, and that's a really complicated instrument. But another way to do that is to, to put it in very carefully um, using a really sharp needle. And so the, the technique is using hydrogen lithography, and this is the area of surface science where we actually study how do you clean, you know, what the atoms are doing, how the atoms interact at the surface of a cell. In this case, we take the silicon crystal, and coat it with hydrogen atoms, 
And if we take a really super sharp tip that's made out of metal, and uh, that's STM for scanning transition microscopy tip, we can actually put a voltage on it and we can uh, uh, pretty much zap it off, give that one hydrogen atom enough energy to get it to release from the surface. And then we can dose it with uh, a phosphorus containing gas. Uh, and so this is hydrogen, three hydrogens and a phosphorus atom making a molecule that can come down and will land in that spot. And anywhere there's a spot, the phosphorus atom will wanna stick. Anywhere there isn't a spot, the phosphorus atom molecule will just bounce off. And then we can go through and we can remove that remaining hydrogen, deposit some silicon and trap the phosphorus in place. And doing this, we can actually place these phosphorus atoms in a single spot with atomic resolution. We can say, I want a phosphorus atom here, and I want one here, and I want another one here. And this is one of the technologies that lets that happen. So it's really cool engineering that's allowing not just images of crystal surfaces, not, not just crystal surfaces, but atomic resolution imaging of crystal surfaces, but also atomic resolution modification of crystal surfaces. And these phosphorus atoms make pretty good qubits. This is one example of uh, uh, one of those qubits where these different yellow areas where there's been a whole bunch of phosphorus atoms that have been added. And there's this island over here that just has a few of phosphorus atoms to make a qubit. There's another area of looking at defects in crystals. And so color centers are really the coolest things. I don't know if anybody studied gemstones, but uh, I got fascinated with gems uh, when I was in high school. And it's not necessarily that every gem is a unique crystal. A lot of times it's the, the impurities, the metal impurities that are in the crystal that make it different colors. And so that's what's really uh, interesting in terms of NV centers or nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond. This is actually a defect that's been known for a hundred years. Uh, it gives diamonds a reddish color when it's put underneath the right uh, amount of light. So it fluoresces red. And when people studied it, it had this feature, this really sharp feature, really narrow spike. And so a narrow spike means that something lives for a really, really long time. And it turns out when studying that it actually, the physical origin of this particular red luminescence is a nitrogen atom that's replaced one of the carbon ones. And right next to it, there's a missing carbon. And so we're looking at very specific types of impurities uh, that's naturally found in diamond. And when we can manufacture them on purpose, and so we can make these thin films of uh, nitrogen enhanced diamond because we can make engineered man-made diamonds and we can make diamond wafers and we can make diamond coatings. And if we look at those diamond atoms uh, using a microscope, uh, we can actually do just like I showed at the beginning of the, the talk where we had a uh, an ion that we were manipulating in its energy states and we had different photons to either move it from the zero to the one level or to read out the information. We can do that with all of these NV centers. So we can do it as an ensemble, a whole collection of NV centers at once. And we can image what the electromagnetic field is in an area. And so this is looking at the magnetic fields that are associated with current going through the wire that's deposited on the surface of this. And so we can make sensors very effectively. And so this is an area of quantum sensing that's really important um, that can uh, perhaps uh, manipulate, uh, be important in terms of not just computing, but how we interact and understand the world around us. Another thing we can do is if we have this thin film of, of nitrogen di doped diamond, we can actually etch out these little pillars. And so each one of these, Pillars, so the pillars are sort of like telephone poles sticking up off the surface. And these have all been manufactured at the same time. Um, and some of them have nitrogen defects in them, some of them don't. And so if you make a whole bunch of them and you search around to figure out which pillars are actually made correctly, uh, you can focus on just those pillars and uh, do some interesting work. This is a map of 
a whole array of these pillars and you can see that they're spaced periodically. In this case, there's one, two, three, four, five. So this is a, a five by five array. And you'll see that the, like the one right underneath where my cursor is, there's no luminescence. So that's one where the manufacturing didn't quite work out, but there are enough of them here that, that work out just fine. So this is a great way to, to interact uh, and to, to study the formation of these structures. But you could also go and select just one of those pillars. So this is one of those pillars that's been cut out and it's put on a, a needle. So it creates this very fine needle and it's sort of like an old fashioned record player. And as you drag that needle across the surface, you can sense magnetic fields um, uh, using the quantum states of this nb center qubit. And so this is a map, these bottom images are a map of uh, a hard drive. So an old school hard drive, not a, not a, a, a modern solid state drive, but a, an old fashioned uh, uh, ladder drive as we call them. And you can see the individual bits that are written on that chip. And there's a whole bunch of other applications in terms of looking at atomic scale uh, features and identifying different states of matter. We can also do something cool in terms of uh, silicon, in terms of trapping electrons. So to date, so far, all the things we've been talking about, we've had the qubit associated with an atom and the atom has been the qubit itself. But we can also use electrostatics and we can put these electrodes on the surface. And when we put those electrodes, we can cause deformations in the potential. And so this graph with the color, with the blue and the red and, uh, the rainbow in between is a measure of the local energy and areas where the electrons would prefer to hang out. And so here you can see three different electrons that are confined in different quantum dots that are all made electrostatically. So here, this is really cool because it's really tunable. We don't have to work with just what nature gives us, but we're now engineering a complete system that allows us to actually do something a little bit more complex so we can engineer the quantum states. And that gives us a bigger degree or gives mankind a bigger degree of freedom to explore different avenues in terms of what's a good way to actually manipulate and use quantum information. And this is an example of such a structure with different electrodes on it. And these are two different maps on the right in terms of what those potentials are. Here, there are two wells. So there would be two electrons that would like to hang out here. And here is a bigger well. And uh, these have been connected together so they all look like a wire. So a lot of engineering design that's possible um, by going from just having a, a, an atom in a structure to having electrostatic design. And the last thing uh, circuit design I wanted to talk about are superconducting quantum circuits. And there are a lot of different types that are out there. Uh, and there are a lot of different designs to look at different aspects of how uh, the quantum information interacts with the material and the environment around it. Uh, these are two different designs of uh, what we call charge qubits. One is a Cooper pair box and one is a transmon. These are made by um, uh, lossless circuits. Uh, when we're dealing with energy levels and quantum information, if we have any energy loss like heating from a resistor um, or uh, an electron escapes, then we lose information because all that information is on a single object. And so we have to make sure that everything has no loss. And so that's what the superconductor comes in um, because there's inherently no resistance associated with them. But we also have to think about designing the circuit. And so here, this is an energy diagram of different states of this circuit. So it's a sort of idea of like what we were talking about in terms of the electron states of atoms, but now we're talking about different states in a circuit that have been quantized. So it's a quantum circuit. And on the X axis here is a plot of what happens when an extra electron comes in. So measurement of charge, different numbers of electrons that go through, or maybe it's just an electrostatic field that's nearby. And in the left plot, you see that there's a lot of curvature. And so if that electric field, if perhaps there's environmental noise and the, the state, the, the electrical um, 
background is moving left to right, then our energy level changes quite a bit. So that gives us noise and sensitivity. But if we design it as a transmon instead, these levels are much flatter. And so there's a lot less influence on the circuit. And so when we, the invention of the transmon actually really helped superconducting qubits. And that's what IBM and Google and Rigetti are using. They're all using these transmon qubits because it was this sort of invention that allowed them to, to get rid of uh, the charge noise, the electrostatic noise in the system. But there are different designs and different layouts. This is a different example where there is resonators and there's this circuit down below. This is called a, a fluxonium. It's a different design concept, but it's been shown to work really, really well um, as well um, as, the, as the transmon. And one of the things we have to work on as we're making these different circuits is that we don't introduce errors. And some of that error is associated with energy loss, like I mentioned just a few minutes ago. And so we do a lot of material science studies in terms of trying to figure out how does the quantum information interact with the materials and the circuit that we build, uh, trying to make it as perfect as possible and, and, and not loss free. And so there's a whole bunch of science and engineering that has to happen in terms of making thin films and understanding electromagnetic radiation and how it is confined into waveguides and may escape into the rest of the experimental space. And this is just uh, an early uh, circuit that was is really the basic of the, the Google quantum computer, where these resonators uh, that are uh, useful for readout, and there are these crosses. This is uh, the Xmon design. And so this is a picture of the chip on the left of what it actually looks like. It's actually really large. Right? And so it's on the scale of millimeters here. So we have a quantum object that's on the order of millimeters as opposed to a quantum object that's the size of an atom, which is you know, much less than a nanometer. And so orders of magnitude difference in terms of how this qubit is put together. And because of its size, this is achievable with the types of tools that we uh, can readily make qubits or circuits out of. And so we can make things more complex. This particular one, this is uh, five different qubits. So this is the, the five qubit um, uh, circuit that was made um, by the team that became Google. So this is my last slide. Really quick tour between a bunch of what I think is really cool technologies associated with different pathways to making information stored onto qubits uh, using atoms identified by spectroscopy, but really taking what nature gave us and going all the way to electrical circuit design and having something that's mathematically equivalent. And, and so that's, that's really cool. So if you're interested in studying quantum information science uh, or going into a career in quantum information science, certainly physics is you know, uh, really important in terms of understanding what's going on. Um, but it's not the only major to, to, to think about. Uh, electrical engineering is really important and there's a lot of research in electrical engineering departments and, and courses that are being offered. Uh, majors that are, are popping up, uh, quite a few of them are in electrical engineering departments. Um, and they focus on the hardware. What I talked about today is quantum hardware, um, but there's also the whole other side in terms of how do you actually get algorithms operating on quantum computing. So the software side is important as well. Computer science is really important. Information science is part of computer science. Um, and uh, that's not only the software, but how do we create what these algorithms are and um, make them efficient? Material science is really important, not just from how do you put the circuits together from a hardware perspective, but also in terms of if we do have a quantum computer that is strong enough or powerful enough to do something interesting, maybe there are some material science applications that. A uh, quantum computer can help us design new materials uh, or optimize materials in a different way. And chemistry is the same sort of thing. Uh, using a quantum computer, we could um, uh, perhaps simulate uh, molecules and come up with something new that's good for biology or um, any other application that um, has a, a complex chemical reaction. Perhaps the petroleum interested industry may benefit from it as well. Uh, and so um, 
lots of different chemical applications for a quantum computer. In terms of degrees, you know, there's right now uh, a lot of people who have invented the field of quantum information science. A lot of them have PhDs. Uh, so if you're interested in doing research and pushing the state of the art, uh, that's um, the type of degree that you need to get. But with the technology maturing and the number of companies that are interested in quantum computing, there certainly is, are lots of opportunities for people who have master's degrees in physics and engineering uh, programs. And what we're actually seeing across the country is that there are a number of bachelor's degrees that are offering quantum information science classes and specializations and concentrations. And so if you are looking around and you wanna uh, study and, and focus on quantum information science, there are some programs that are starting. And, and what things to look at is do they offer an introduction to quantum information science class for undergraduates? There are a number of them out there and, and a lot that are under development. So um, hopefully with this summer, it's a little bit helpful for some of the choices that you'll be thinking about uh, in the next uh, uh, little while. And I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has at this point. So here's a question. Yes. Is that Marlou? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Chris. This is really a great overview. Uh, you mentioned several physical implementations of quantum computers. Mm -hmm. What would be your bet? What will be the best quantum computer eventually? The best one eventually? Oh, that's really hard. Um, what, what's really interesting, what's playing out now um, is that uh, the superconducting field got to a, a great start. Um, and uh, we've seen demonstrations, the, the Google supremacy uh, example that came out um, maybe 18 months ago or so. Uh, so superconducting qubits definitely have done great things. Um, there are roadmaps in terms of getting to, to bigger and bigger quantum computers. Um, but Honeywell and IonQ have announced some pretty impressive plans and some, some nice machines. What's really interesting is that I think there's gonna be competition for a while. And it's not clear to me that uh, the systems that are beneficial in terms of making computers that have 10 or 100 or even 1000 qubits are the ones that are gonna be just as competitive when we go to, to bigger machines. So. There's a long ways to go and I still too early. I'm not gonna say I have a favorite. Um, I'm actually working in a couple of different areas. I, I do research in superconductor and semiconductor qubits because I think they're all very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, Jonathan, you have a question too? Yes, also there are a few questions in chat posted, but my question is, how do you think some of these models and quantum computers in general will improve in the future? So I, some of the things that I, you know, right now we're at a, a position where the quantum hardware isn't quite powerful enough to do useful things. Uh, and I think that's gonna change in the next couple of years. Uh, some of the things that are being done uh, in terms of like molecular modeling, uh, they are being, done at the moment, uh, but the molecules have like one or two or, th or three simple atoms that are combined together that are easy to predict using classical computing techniques. Um, and so there's this NISC area, this uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. And it's really interesting to see what's gonna happen in, in that space over the next couple of years. Uh, so the algorithms have to develop, the application space has to be developed and the hardware also needs to, to be improved. Uh, and that's gonna happen you know, over the course of the next, I don't know, maybe four to 10 years or something like that. So things are gonna get really exciting. Um, for those of you that are in high school, things are gonna get really exciting when you enter the workplace. And, and I think the industry is gonna be very different than it is today.
And um, so thank you for pointing me to chat, Jonathan. Uh, so I saw a question from Peter. Hopefully I, I mentioned uh, my, my answer to Jonathan with, uh, with, in terms of timelines for these things. There's a question here about superconductive versus ion trap. I think I already answered that one. Uh, so there's a question here by AC about the maximum realistic number of qubits. Uh, so that's actually really interesting. A couple of companies have actually published roadmaps for improving uh, the, the computer's um, capability. And there, there, there are two or three different things that are important to consider. You know, one of the things we think about is size is the most important thing. Who's got the most qubits? Um, but that's not necessarily the most important thing. Uh, one of the things that are important in terms of how many actual operations can you do before you lose the coherency in your qubits. And so it's not just the number of qubits, but it's the, also the number of operations. And there are different ways to actually uh, uh, estimate what that is. Uh, in terms of these um, these lossy computers that we're we're working with today, um, and it's really interesting to see how that will progress. And I think it's the combination of those two things that are really really important. So it seems like there are no more questions. So first of all, if any of us in the live session or anyone watching the recording have any more further questions, what's the best way to contact you? So I'm happy to answer questions. Um, you can reach out to me. Um, uh, you can look me up. Uh, online. I, I have an appointment at the University of Maryland. Uh, you can send me uh, an email if you'd like at cjkr at umd.edu. Um, and uh, happy to answer any additional questions that people may have. Do you have a link for the presentation? I think somebody asked that on the chat. I don't have a link, um, but I'll look into posting it on my web page. And, and share that with uh, with Jonathan. Okay, great, thank you. So yes, the workshop has lasted for more than an hour. So I think we can, yeah, we can end this workshop here. So thank you so much for presenting in this workshop and it was great having you. It was my pleasure, thank you for inviting me.